Welcome to the second half of Module 6 of Genomic Selection, where we were talking about some of the basics of implementing genomic selection in a breeding program, and particularly focusing on the training population. Here are some real-life examples of training populations I've dealt with in my winter wheat breeding program. At the top here is uh, what I would think of as my ideal training population. These are uh, 470 lines, all derived directly from my breeding program and things that were going to enter into my testing. There is very little structure to this population. The population does produce high yield, a good disease resistance, but it also varies for all these traits. So this is what I think of as a very uh, ideal training population. This one down here, this second training population, is more of what you might find in a cooperative breeding trial. These are lines from six different uh, breeding programs that were tested in these six different, uh, by these six different breeders. And what you see here is we definitely have some population structure. There's a small subgroup of lines out here that's quite different from the large mass of lines over here. So now we have population structure. And what we have found here, it's best to just eliminate these outlying groups. Build your model on the main group, assuming it's large enough to make a valid model. In this case, it was. And you actually get better predictions that are very relevant to at least this subgroup of lines. Here's my third training population we've dealt with. It's about 650 winter wheat lines. They've been placed in three clusters, as you can see here. Now, it's less than ideal that we have so much population structure in here, but what's nice is because it was 650 lines, each cluster is actually fairly large in itself. For example, here is a cluster 2. That's about 220 lines in there. And we could build a prediction model using only data from lines from cluster 2 and get high accuracy. Same thing over here with cluster 1. There's only about 110 lines in this cluster, so it's not very large, but the lines themselves are highly related to one another, and again, we were able to build a prediction model that was uh, had produced pretty high accuracy. Now, interesting thing about this is these two clusters are sampling two different regions of the genetic space. The model based on information from cluster 1 at phenotypic data, that genotypic data, that model does not predict the phenotypes of lines in cluster 3, or cluster 2. Each of these clusters actually represents different genetics and different uh, um, uh, genetic architectures of these traits so that one information from one cluster does not predict the other. Here's more examples of training populations. This one on the left is a good one. And here you have a set of lines occupying a genetic space. They've been phenotyped, let's say, for disease resistance, so some of them are somewhat susceptible and some are somewhat resistant. When you build, this is your training population, when you build your GS model using this data, you're building the model over that genetic information from that entire genetic space. Now, when you start to implement genetic selection, you're going to select the best individuals from here and cross them. Now, in that case, you're picking the resistant ones, and the resistant lines have genes that sample, again, the entire genetic space. So therefore, when you set up your selection population here, it has sampled the same genetic space that you're going to use to build your genomic selection model on. And that means that your model based on that training population will be relevant to your selection population. In contrast, you have the scenario on the right, where now you have a highly structured population. The lines fall in one of two groups. And unfortunately, all your resistant lines are down in this one group down here. All right, and when you go to uh, do your selections and start genomic selection, you're going to cross resistant by resistant. And that is sampling a very small part of the genetic space while your genomic selection model, the training population, is going to be built on using data from the entire genetic space. Therefore, that model is probably not going to be relevant to this selection population that you will generate from, from selecting only a small area of that total genetic space. And here's an example in real life. Uh, we looked at, uh, I was associated with a project that looked at bacterial blight resistance in rice, and the phenotyping was done in a germplasm collection. 
And as is often the case, the germplasm collection was highly structured. We could easily take the lines and put them in one of three groups. And unfortunately, most of the resistant lines resided in cluster number two, one cluster, and most of the susceptibles fell into a different cluster called cluster one. And again, you're going to build, this, this whole thing is your training population, you're going to build your GS model on genetic information from this whole set of lines. But when you actually go to implement genomic selection, you're going to cross resistant by resistant and start into your selection population. Well, you have sampled a very small portion of the genetic space that the genomic selection model was built on. And that's not a good situation. So you have to think about this. Your uh, big key part here is the relationship of the training population to the selection population. You want them to be genetically related, highly related. And that's the situation we see on the left, where the training population and selection population are sampling the same genetic space. Therefore, the model built on the training population should have relevance to the selection population. And the scenario on the right is the less desirable scenario, where your selection population is not highly related to the training population. So therefore, it's unlikely that the model built on the training population will have much predictive, predictive ability in your selection population. Here's what I think of as an ideal training population and selection population scenario. You have one uh, training population. It's not structured, no structure in it. And ideally, this might be breeding lines from your breeding program. You have individuals in there. They're all phenotyped. You select the best ones, make crosses amongst them. And the individuals you have selected as parents occupy the entire genetic space sample the entire genetic space of your training population. You cross them, you get your progeny, and now you have a selection prop, uh, population that is cycle one of genomic selection. Notice that these uh, selected individuals occupy the same genetic space as your training population. You build the model based on the training population, predict the breeding value of each of these individuals in cycle one, Select the best ones, again sampling from the entire genetic space, and get cycle two. Now the lines in cycle two, cycle one, and the training population are all still sampling the same genetic space, and therefore the GS model you build using data from the training population should have good predictive value in this selection population as well as this selection population. You've sampled the same genes from the same genetic space. And here's just an example of that in uh, my program. We had a training population of 470 lines. And they're shown in this uh, principal component graph in the blue. And from those, we made crosses, derived F2 individuals. And those are shown in the genetic space in red. And you can see there's a great deal of overlap in this genetic space of the training population lines and their progeny. And what that means is, uh, the GS model based on the training population should have pretty good predictive value for the F2 individuals derived from that training population. Training population size is always a very crucial thing. The literature always says that larger is generally better, but you have to consider things other than that. If you have a collection of lines that aren't very related, then you do need a very large training population to get accurate GS models. And you have a population of lines that are actually highly related to the other, you can actually get away with a much smaller training population. And heritability is always a factor. You have, uh, if you have low heritability, you have to have a larger training population to attain a certain accuracy than if you have high heritability. And that is shown down here. Here we plot out uh, how much accuracy you get with different population sizes with different heritabilities. Let's say you want to get an accuracy of 0.6 from your training population. If your trait is highly heritable, then you don't need much of a population size to attain that uh, accuracy. But if you have very low heritability on your trait, your phenotypes, to get an accuracy of 0.6, you may have to genotype and phenotype 6,000 individuals. Obviously, this is not very practical for most of us, and we're fortunate in plant breeding in that we can keep running our phenotyping trials, more reps, more locations, and 
if we keep doing that, we generally will increase our heritability and therefore not have to deal with population sizes like this. Phenotyping that training population is crucial. You must be able to do it accurately. And that, of course, this has become a huge challenge when you have large training populations. It's easier to get accurate phenotypes when you're uh, phenotyping 15 lines. But if you're phenotyping 400 lines, it's a much larger challenge. So theoretically, these large populations will increase your accuracy. But if you have such a challenge in phenotyping them accurately that you end up with low heritability, because you can't accurately phenotype 400 lines, then you may actually end up with decreasing your GS accuracy. So there's always these trade-offs. So one way to try to adequately phenotype a large set of lines is to do this cooperatively with your colleagues. It's because there's only a limited amount of phenotyping you, you can do. But if you have colleagues that can help you with the phenotyping by running that trial in their locations and uh, benefiting from it, then that's a good way to go. Need high heritability, and that can be a challenge again with you have large populations. You're growing, a, let's say, a set of 400 lines within the environment and phenotyping them for yield. You're going to have a lot of within environment error variance, and you need ways to control that, ways better than a randomized complete block design. You should consider alpha lattices, augmented design, spatial analyses, and other things to control the variation within an environment and a test of that size. You must also phenotype in relevant environments. You can build the training population on these certain set of phenotypes. Those phenotypes must be relevant to your future environments that you, your uh, lines will encounter. And you must also effectively deal with your genotype by environment interactions for a lot of traits. In summary, forming a training population is a crucial step to the success of genomic selection, and phenotyping it accurately is also crucial. If you can't do these first two things, correctly, then your genomic selection project will fail. There are multiple ways to form a training population and it should be relevant to your variety development goals. It is a breeding tool more than a genetics tool. A highly structured population should be avoided and training populations should be highly related to the selection populations themselves. Here's a quiz for unit module 6 and if you want to take it, and want me to look at your answers, please feel free to send them to me. And thank you for viewing this tutorial. And if you have any questions, go back to slide one and see all my contact information and uh, let me know.